you would. <laughs> okay. And I'll enter presentation mode. So feel free to interrupt me at any time if you would have um, any questions throughout the talk or if there would be anything that is unclear. I don't think I can see the chat uh, from this view. Um, but uh, but yeah, but if there are any questions that are, uh, you know, would uh, would be good to be addressed uh, while the talk is on, uh, you know, let me know. Um, okay, so uh, thanks everybody for coming. <clears throat> My name is uh, Adam Warski. I um, am currently in Warsaw, Poland. And I would like to talk a bit about uh, how to do functional programming when uh, working with a relational database. Um, I think even though we all do probably you know, high performance, resilient backend and so on, NoSQL, uh, Kafka, Kubernetes and so on, uh, day to day we quite often work with relational databases uh, anyway. So it's good to have a good abstraction, it's, to, it's good to have a good library to actually uh, be able to work in some way uh, with 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 such kind of uh, databases. Um, so this is going to be a mainly live coding talk. We will uh, go through, uh, we'll implement a simple example uh, of acting with a database, and uh, uh, yeah, and 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 we'll see how it looks uh, in practice. Uh, so we can you know experience firsthand um, how you can be functional and still still do effectful things like talking to a database. So, but before we actually go into any functional programming and go into any Scala and so on, let's look a bit at the current state of affairs. Um, so still the, the, the most popular solution, uh, at least on the JVM, would be using uh, Hibernate or JPA. Uh, and this usually means using annotations. Um, and, you know, without a doubt, it's a successful solution. So you can't deny that it's uh, it, it works uh, very well for a number of uh, applications. Uh, it allowed many applications to become re really successful, mm, uh, but that doesn't mean you know that you can you cannot look for a better solution and that uh, you cannot actually try to fix the shortcomings of uh, of the current approach. So so what are the shortcomings, right? So like the first shortcoming for me is the uh, the reliance on annotations which uh, themselves have a lot of problems i think which can be fixed like annotations really improved a lot uh, the way the way we did programming in java from java 4 to java 5 um, and onwards um, and they certainly had a big role in improving the overall uh, quality and the overall experience of writing software but you know functional programming might be the next might be the next step uh, so what are the problems with annotations? Well, first of all, is that annotations form like a mini language embedded inside of Java. So we have like the regular Java language, uh, you know, with conditionals, if strings, numbers, and so on. And then on top of that, you have the annotation language, which is built on top. And it's it's quite a language. You cannot do much with it. Um, you only get some very basic type safety, like uh, that a certain name is defined and uh, that certain parameters can have certain values, but that's mostly it, right? There's no control structures. There's uh, no way to express the fact that some annotations can come together or can't be together, right? The, there's no way to group annotations. Uh, well, there's no standard way of, of grouping annotations. There are some, uh, sometimes the containers which interpret the annotations actually support it, but that's like on a case by case basis. So, uh, so yeah, so it's a, it's a Annotations form like a small language which isn't really type safe, and, and I guess that's one area where we can improve. Um, more specifically, when uh, talking about uh, relational databases, when working with a JPA, uh, it's not immediately uh, obvious where are the transaction boundaries. So when you delineate a transaction using JPA or Hibernate, you usually you usually use something like a transaction annotation or something like that. And uh, you never know, like, where is the transaction exactly going to start and end. Um, so it might be like if you call a transaction method from 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 an, from another transaction method, the transactional scope will actually be, be extended. So uh, it's hard to be precise uh, about exactly where transactions start and commit. 
which is a very important trait, I think, when working with a re re relational database, since one of the main features of the type of data store is the transactionality. Um, second, there are some problems with multi-threading. So uh, anything that's uh, based on hybrid or GenPA usually relies on thread locals to propagate the session on the entity manager. So that doesn't play well with asynchronous execution. Um, another problem is that we have a framework and some form of AOP to make this work. Um, so these are all areas where we can improve. Uh, some things that we want to keep still is the, the explorability and the understandability of the of the solution. Like if you look at a, a program using JPA or Hibernate, you, well, one thing is that it's quite familiar to most people now. But the other is that the code is quite often clear, does so we would like to keep to keep that in, in our solution. So, um, so while exploring the, the the alternative, it's good to have in mind like what are we comparing against, right? What's the what's the alternative? Um, okay, so let's uh, uh, before before we actually dive into the code, a short introduction, like uh, maybe giving some basis on why would I be a good person to actually talk about. Um, accessing uh, a database from uh, and uh, uh, comparing libraries to do that. So uh, I've been coding backend applications for a long, a long time now, 14 years, I think, uh, using a variety of stacks. Um, so from Hibernate through Lyft, Active Record, which is a, a Ruby thing, um, Slick, and uh, now most often Doobie. So I've used a way a wide uh, range of tools. So I think I have some um, uh, some experience with that, which might be helpful here. I also uh, work on um, a couple of open source libraries, which uh, which give me the perspective from from you know from the library writer, uh, and this often has different challenges than uh, than writing an application. And uh, yeah, apart from open source, what I do day to day is uh, I'm the, the uh, co-founder and a software engineer, Dr. Mel. Uh, we are a company which helps uh, businesses scale their operations through software. We usually work on backend systems, um, you know, doing some software for big data, some machine learning, blockchain, messaging. Uh, anything that's distributed needs a resilience uh, or scaling that would probably fall in our area of expertise. And we often use Scala as a tool along with other uh, popular, let's say, uh, things like Kafka and Cassandra. Uh, but as I said, like our applications, like almost every, every, every one of those, every, every, almost every application that we work on has some has a relational component. Um, I sometimes write on on uh, the software blog and I have a Twitter. So if you'd like, uh, please take a look. Uh, take a look at the schema that we are going to work with. So the schema is going to be quite simple. So uh, we are going to only uh, look at the top part here, the jobs table. Um, so what we are going to do is we are going to write a very simple queue implementation, um, a database-backed uh, queue. So uh, actually, if if you know if you have if you need to run some uh, jobs uh, asynchronously and there's not a lot of them, you quite often can just write. Uh, and of course, you have a relational database in your system. You can quite often just write a queue based on a on that instead of you know setting up uh, things like. Uh, Rabbit or using SQS or using uh, Redis. Uh, so quite often just using the database is sufficient. So that's what we are going to do here. So we will uh, create a table in which will hold the jobs to, to be executed. Each, jo each uh, job has an ID and um, uh, there's some content. So that's like the data of the job, right? And there's the next delivery timestamp. And uh, that's the mechanism which we are going to use to lock messages. So when we receive a message from the queue, we are going to set the next delivery to some point in the future. And when looking for jobs to execute, we are only going to look for jobs where the next delivery is in the past, right? So that's a very similar mechanism to how Amazon SQS works, if you are familiar with that. Um, over there, we also set the next, uh, when, when we receive a message, we actually bump the next delivery 
to some point in the future, which effectively locks locks the, locks the job in the database. So we are going to to write a system which which allows you to schedule jobs and then and then execute them. A very simple one. So that's uh, that's our uh, that's our schema. So uh, before we write any code, we will create a very simple data class which will store uh, which will, which will represent a job uh, that is submitted to our queue. So it will be a case class case class job. Um, so a data class, uh, it will have a, a ID which is a UID, the content which is a string. And notice that we don't have the next delivery timestamp here. We don't actually need it. We will only use it inside the database. We will never need to represent it uh, in, when reading data from, from, from the queue. So that's, uh, that's our data representation. So the first thing that we might want to do is actually submit a new job uh, to our queue. So we will uh, need some, some form of an insert uh, method. And that insert method will take a single parameter, which will be the content of the job. So what should be done? Like it's probably should be the, it probably would be like some kind of JSON or some other serialized data which would specify what the job should do and execute it. So um, and that method will return something that's called a connection IO uh, of a unit. So it will be you know just run for its side effects, hence the the unit return value. Um, so uh, what we are going to do here is we are going to use a library that's called the Doobie. Uh, that library is uh, used to talk uh, to work with relational databases, and uh, it does. It's it's not actually. It's uh, if you are used to ORMs, it might look weird because it takes a totally different approach. So when working with Doobie, we quite often uh, write or most often write uh, raw SQL queries. Well, not, not really raw, but we write SQL directly. So that's what we are going to do here as well. So uh, to write SQL queries, uh, Doobie defines an, an interpolator, a SQL interpolator. So if you know, if you are familiar with, interpol uh, with string interpolators, which look like this, I am, uh, uh, we can do some expressions here, string interpolator. Right, so that's a string in interpolator. It starts with an S, and it means we can embed expressions into into that string, and we get back an interpolated string. In the same way, we have a SQL interpolator, and in, it starts with SQL, not surprisingly. And here we can write SQL queries. So we, uh, in our insert method, we are going to create a SQL query which inserts into jobs ID content next to delivery. And we are going to insert values, which are UID random, uh, random ID, uh, content, and instant with now. So we are going to do it like that. So it's actually compiles. Yes. And uh, Adam, yeah. we just uh, got one request, uh, which sure. is a bit of an odd one, uh, to decrease the font size. Decrease um, the font size. Yeah. Okay. So sure. perhaps if we decrease it, we'll see a little bit more on the screen. Sure, sure. Uh, presentation mode. Let's try maybe 28. No, that's not a big difference. Oh, Let's wait. No, somebody else is saying don't decrease the font size. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with 28. It's a bit smaller. So maybe, you know, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, so uh, we insert these three values into our uh, jobs uh, into our jobs table, and, uh, and yeah, that's that's all we need to do in our query. Uh, so we need to strip the margin, right? Because we have these pipes here, so we strip margin like in a like in, in a string when working with Scala. Um, so now we actually have to tell Doobie what kind of query it is, right? Because Doobie for Doobie is just a, like a string with some values embedded in it. Um, Adam, could yeah? you uh, sure. open up the imports uh, on line three so that we can just see the Doobie imports that you've got? Sure. There's quite a lot of imports here, which we are going to use later as well, right? The, but you can actually see which ones are used, right? The, the ones we are using so far is the Doobie underscore and the Doobie implicits. Um, so later we are also going to use a couple of other ones. Uh, but these are the two main ones which you need, uh, which we you need when working with Doobie. Um, 
so that's a that's a good note actually you always need to look at the imports um okay so back, back into our method uh, yeah so we have to tell Duby what kind of query it is because like Duby doesn't know it's just a like a string expression so it can be a select it can be an insert so Duby has to know like what to expect as a result of that query, right? So in this case, it's an insert uh, or an update that's like the same thing. So we are telling Duby that it's an update and we don't really care about the return value. So by default, the return value is the number of modified rows. We don't care about that. So we just map it to unit and, uh, and we are done. Okay, so now let's try actually running our, uh, our, our insert method. We insert job one, right? Okay. So let's run this code. We see it's always good to see if things compile and run. Yes, okay, so we run. And yeah, the process finished, so we didn't you know, do anything. So now let's look at the database, if the data is actually sorted. In here. So that's over here. As you can see, I have the, the app, like a GUI for Postgres, and here we have our jobs table. And unfortunately, like there's no data in there. Right, so something didn't actually work, or maybe it did. So what we actually did here is we only created a, a description of what operations on the database we should do when we want to insert something into into the database. So what we did is we only allocated some memory. Um, so we created a value of type connection IO, uh, which is written down here. And types of that value are exactly uh, this. They are a description of some operations on the database. So if you've worked with Scala before, you probably have seen maybe an IO data type. And an IO data type, again, is a description of some side effects, right? So here we have a description of some side effects. However, they are not like any side effects. They, they need a connection to be run, right? You, they need to have an open database connection to actually execute these side effects. And um, and uh, again, yeah, what we have created is just a description inside. Uh, uh, we have allocated some memory to, to create the description, but we didn't actually do anything on the database, right? So, um, so yeah, so that's one, one, one thing that's missing here, that was missing here, so that, that we only created the description. We still have to run it, right? We have to run it, and we somehow have to supply that connection. So what we are missing here is some form of uh, uh, some, some way of providing these connections, and that's uh, that's what the, the a, tra a transactor does. A transactor maintains a connection pool for us, so that we can actually run our descriptions of our queries and execute them against a real database. So what we are going to do right now is we are going to allocate a transactor. Uh, of like transactor IO. Uh, the IO data type here is the type to which our uh, descriptions will be interpreted. So we are going to interpret a side effect which needs a connection into a description of side effects which don't need a connection, which have their connection provided. Um, so we are going to a transactor uh, from a driver manager and we are going to provide some boring however necessary details for each uh, for each uh, connection pool so we're going to provide the driver implementation the jdpc connection string postgres equal fp and the username is postgres and the password is empty and uh, that's not all we also have to provide a thread pool on which uh, using which the transactor should uh, uh, the, the, the thread pool with the transactor should use to execute queries so we this need to be set values so we create the context shift implicit value of like a default instance using the execution context global so these are like some, let's say, technical technicalities from uh, from Cuts Effect. You don't really have to worry about those. Uh, these are just things that you, for the time being, that you need to have in in scope for things to work. Okay, so we have created a transactor instance, and when we create that, this allocates uh, a connection pool which we can use. So now what we can uh, do is we take the result of that method call. Again, the result of that method call 
is a value that describes some operations on the database. So what we do is uh, we now need to run these operations uh, in a transaction, called, so we call the transact method using the given transactor. So what this does, uh, this will create uh, a, side, a description of side effects, which do five things. They, first of all, take a connection from the pool, they start a transaction, they execute the description as, as given here in that value, they commit the transaction and they release the the connection back to the database. Okay, so let's run our code now. See if the transaction will actually run. So again, things compiled. Okay, exit code zero, going to our database and still nothing. So what we are missing. <clears throat> so if we you don't know what's happening, it's of it's often helpful to actually look at the type. So um, let's look at the type over here. It's type annotations. Well, it's an IO data type. Uh, so an IO again is a description of any side effects, some side effects like not needing echo anymore. However, it's still uh, it's still lazy, right? It's still just a description. It still needs to be run. So to actually run it, what we have to do is we have to uh, use one of the methods to actually run things. Uh, one of them is unsafe run sync. Unsafe run sync is a method which you should all, uh, ideally run only once at the end of the world so at the where your where your program when your whole description of program is actually assembled and then you run unsafe run sync so that's our case right so let's run things now and see if things get inserted in the database finally exit close okay and yes good so something worked we have we have our what single row in the database so you know, this might seem like a, a lot of indirection because we have first created a description of an operation of a database. Then we have interpreted it into a description of arbitrary side effects and only then we need to run them. But this actually gives us a lot of flexibility, which we will see a bit of later. Uh, before, so, yeah. uh, before we go on, a um, couple of questions, Adam. Sure. Uh, so uh, on, on the stuff that we've been doing here. So with this uh, SQL, um, or a SQL string interpolator. Do you know uh, whether Doobie provides any um, uh, uh, SQL sanitization to prevent ah, yes, uh, injection? Uh, so yes, yes, yes. So and uh, so all of these all of these values over here, which are embedded, uh, these expressions which are embedded into the SQL, they are escaped uh, according to SQL rules. So SQL injection is not possible. So that's not like uh, it's not creating a string from you know gluing a string together, uh, because if it was creating a string, we, we would just use the string interpolator. So we are using the SQL interpolator, and it actually you know is aware of the context that this is a SQL. Uh, we are living in a SQL world, and all of these values are escaped. Yes, yeah, so we are safe from that. Um, and that's, another, that's a good question. Thanks. Thanks. Um, another question from me is that um, can you take this and uh, do any compile time validation against the tables that you're actually querying? Uh, no, you cannot do any compile time validation. Uh, you can do it in tests. Well, actually, maybe there is. Uh, I think there is some kind of um, a macro uh, framework which tries to connect to the database and validate it, but. Uh, I would be quite wary of an idea where uh, of some code which would actually connect the database when compiling code. So um, I would rather do it in tests. So uh, what we usually do is we just have tests which run against an embedded database or a Dockerized database and simply check the queries by running them and you get an errors. They are quite nicely logged. Um, and, you know, any syntax errors. Of course, it's not ideal, uh, but uh, but it works quite well. Another thing is that you get also nice support from IntelliJ. Like you can see that all of this is syntax highlighted uh, because IntelliJ knows it's SQL. Uh, I guess it has Ruby support built in by now. And yeah, if I do uh, if I do uh, a typo here, it will actually underline it. But that's an IntelliJ feature, right? Because um, it, I have uh, somehow somewhere, uh, let me see, not here, maybe eight. No. Uh, there's like a tab uh, on the right, usually here. 
uh, which uh, allows you to you know specify the schema that you are working with and IntelliJ validates the queries against that. So that's another helpful thing, but yeah, that's like an IntelliJ feature. Hey, um, just a couple more questions. Um, so uh, one just relating to the code that you're writing now. Um, are you planning on putting this uh, on GitHub later on, potentially? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there will be a link at the end, yeah. Cool. It's on GitHub. Thanks. And um, then also uh, on this particular code. So um, are your parameters here, uh, are they escaped? Um, or does uh, DB generate a parameterized, parameterized SQL query when it's running it? A prepared statement, you mean? Um, I think that's what Joe means. Joe, could you clarify? Yeah, I guess, well, because we've covered the escaping uh, before, right? These are all escaped, so there's no SQL injection uh, possible. And yes, all of these queries will be converted to, to prepared statements. And uh, so this, this, uh, this will end up as uh, JDBC parameters uh, applied to the prepared statement. So that's handled for us. Okay. All right. I think that's that's pretty clear to me. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so you know, actually, uh, a, a lot of people are often amazed, like uh, that. You know, it's 2020, and now we are supposed to write SQL by hand because in the past 20 years we've been rather taught not to do that, right, and to uh, try avoiding writing SQL. And that was my first reaction as well, after, you know, doing Hibernate and then Slick, which has a, like a Scala API for writing queries. But I must say that it's like really liberating to be able to write uh, SQL in the language of the database. It gives you a lot of freedom so you can use any, li uh, any uh, database feature you like. And well, you, sp you speak the native language of the database, so you're not trying to hide it somewhere and you know, each each representation of uh, of SQL in, in in the host language will uh, be uh, by necessity poorer than what you can actually do in SQL. So I think writing SQL in SQL is really a good idea. If you really don't want to do that uh, and you would like to use Doobie, there's still an option. I can show it also later. Uh, you can generate some of these queries uh, if, if if you'd like to. But but the default of writing SQL is really really nice. Uh, even though it might look scary at first. Um, okay, so let's now do something a bit uh, slightly more complicated. So a receive method, right? We have a way of inserting jobs. Now let's try to write a method to receive a job from the uh, from 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 the database. So we will write a method which uh, returns an optional job, an option uh, of a job. Uh, write the it's a connection I hope. Uh, it's possible that there is uh, no job waiting, so the, hence the option. Uh, so what we will do here is we will first uh, uh, grab the current time and we will calculate the next delivery of a job if we find if we find it. So now plus seconds 100. So we will lock messages for 100 seconds. So now let's look. Let's create a query to find the, the next job. Uh, so again, we write SQL. Uh, we select the ID and content from uh, jobs where uh, where next delivery is smaller than now, and we want to limit the results to one, right? And uh, one more thing that we need to do if we want to run this code concurrently. So if we, if we want to receive concurrently from many nodes. We have to make sure that only one transaction grabs a certain a job. So we need to lock the file. We need to lock the job that we find uh, so that others cannot uh, cannot select it as well. So we will use the for update here. The, that that takes a, a row lock on the uh, on the selected uh, data. So now that's a SQL query. So we have a strip marking and that's a select query. So again, we have to tell Doobie what kind of query it is. So this time it's not an update. It's a query which should map to a job. So how does this mapping work? So here we give a Doobie the case class uh, to which the results should be serialized. And Doobie will try to map each column from, from, the, 
from the resulting select into a field in our uh, in our uh, in, in the given case class, right? So uh, here the first column will go to the first field, the second column will go to the second field. Um, so what is checked on at compile time is that Doobie knows how to convert uh, a raw SQL value of some type into a value of uh, of this type. So Doobie checks at compile time that uh, the UUID and these types are supported, and these of course are supported out of the box, and you can write support for your custom types uh, as well, right? So that's that's one thing that is checked at compile time. So we query for a job, and then we also have to specify how many jobs uh, do we expect? Is it one? Is it many? Uh, so here we uh, expect an optional job. Um, and this will actually give us uh, a connection IO uh, of an optional job. Um, so that's, uh, that's as expected. Okay, that's good. Uh, so once we select a job, we actually have to update the next delivery so that it's locked from subsequent invocations, right? So, but only if, if, if we found one. So what we do is now we have to sequence two operations in the same transaction, right? It's very important. That's where we use the transactionality feature of our data store, that we need to do this operate two operations in a single transaction, the select and the update of the next delivery. So what we do is we sequence two operations on the database and sequencing two operations is uh, quite often done using FlatMap. FlatMap uh, basically says do the first thing and then do the second thing depending on the result of the first. So here uh, we first uh, look, at, look for the job and then if we haven't found any jobs, well, we don't really, uh, like there's nothing to log, right? So we just, uh, again, return uh, none, which is an option of job. Here we have to tell, uh, help a bit with the uh, type inference. Uh, so what we do here is we return, we still need to return like a description of operations on uh, on the database, right? And uh, same with flat map. Like flat map takes some description of operations on a database and sequences it with further descriptions of operations on a database. So here we just return an empty description, which doesn't do anything. So that's the none case. Now, if there is a job that has been found, um, what we need to do is we need to run a SQL which will update uh, things. So update jobs, sec next delivery equals the next delivery that we have calculated over here. Uh, where ID, again, let's do this trick, where ID is equal to the found jobs uh, ID. And again, that's a uh, that's an update, uh, so we have to specify that. And uh, we, uh, so this will return the number of modified rows, which isn't that interesting. What we need to do is we need to ignore that result and return the job that has been found. So we map the value of the, uh, the return value of that query into a sum job, okay. And this should all type check nicely. Yes, it does. So again, what we do in our receive method, uh, first we, uh, do a uh, we do a select, uh, which looks for the next job, and then we sequence that operation with the, with the next operation, which is either updating the found job and setting the next delivery timestamp, or doing nothing, right? And in both uh, in both cases, we work on the level of the on the level of descriptions, uh, right? So we only create a description of the operations that actually should be should be done, right? So now we can actually receive and uh, and send uh, jobs. Okay, so uh, let's try running a maybe a bit more sophisticated program, which will uh, insert some jobs and receive some jobs, so we can see how this how all of this works. So uh, we will uh, need a... So, uh, yeah. Just before you go on to that, Adam, um, sure, do you want to scroll up a bit so I can ask some questions on sure, this sure. code above? Cool. Um, so a few things. Um, so uh, first question is, uh, is Connection IO a monad? Yes, it is, yes. I think, in fact, it's uh, actually probably going to be a, maybe an effect even, possibly an async, uh, but yes, yeah, it's a... Yeah, yeah. It's uh, does it implement effect? Uh, possibly. Yeah, I, I, I guess it does, yes, yes. 
Possibly, but but essentially, yes, I think it is. As you said, because yes, you can also moment. you can also uh, lift any you can lift any I/O effect effect with the interconnection I/O. So you can say that I want to run this arbitrary effect in the scope of a transaction, right? So for example, maybe you want to do something on a database, then I don't know, send an email and then do something else on a database, all in the scope of the same transaction, right? Meaning that if sending the email fails, the transaction will fail. So you can lift any effect into a connection, uh, into a connection IO value, which will effectively make it part of the of the broader transaction. So so yeah, you can do quite a lot of things with that. And that that makes it really powerful actually when you think about it like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's uh, that's true. It makes it very flexible in the way you can, um, that, which was one of our goals. So we can very precisely specify what what should be in the tr in the transaction and what should be outside of the transaction, right? Because if you have a value of type connection IO, well, that's going to end up being a in a in a transaction, right? And then when you go from a connection IO to an IO by interpreting the connection IO value. Uh, into a, an effect, into a transactional effect, you know that this is already a, a value which will begin a transaction, and commit a transaction, and that whatever you do later will be already outside. Um, so so you, can, you can be very precise about what happens when. And this, you know, has also very, has business implications, right? Because it's a business, like a, from a business point of view, it's a difference if we, if sending an email, for example, or some other side effect, fails a transaction or, or not, right? We, we might want to commit the transaction and then try sending the email, or, maybe we are, or, we, or we might want to make sending the email part of the transaction and you know, fail if, if, if it fails. So it's ultimately a business decision which way you want to compose these. Okay. Um, another question that we have on, um, well, on the creation of this particular connection I have here, is uh, we've written uh, the values now and let's next delivery. Those are going to get created um, when we call receive, aren't they? They're not going to get created when the connection I/O is yes. run. Yes, uh, yes, that's uh, that's uh, that's good. That's a good uh, remark. Uh, in reality, I should delay this, right? So I should. Uh, Create a connection I/O which is lazy, which lazily evaluates those. Yeah, that's a good uh, remark. However, in this case, it's going to work because uh, we are redefining a method which is going to be called multiple times. But yeah, that's a simplification that I made here. Uh, but in reality, it shouldn't be done. So yes, you're right. So what well, we should done in reality is wrap all of this into one more connection I/O which first computes these values and then uses them later. Um, because these are also side effects, right? That's that's the side effects which should be which should be wrapped uh, as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think um, that's a good. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, paying attention very closely. I see. That's good. <laughs> that's good, of course. <laughs> yeah, you've got a very diligent audience. Um, and one last question on uh, the code in nextjob.flatmap. We have when we get a job, uh, we map on the job and return. Um, I think we actually discard the uh, job we get back and return an option of uh, the job that we get no, back. No, uh, we don't discard it. We, we return it here, right? Because we want to. Um, so we get the job, and if it's found, we run an update, right? And then we discard the results of the update and return the original job that has been found. Okay. So, right. so it survives. So it survives. Yeah. We, we, we need its data, right? We need the content of the job to actually do things with it. So. Right, and I think that the result of the update is not going to be the updated job, is it? I think it's actually a count. Yeah, possibly. it will be again a count of uh, updated jobs. It's an end, yeah. Okay. You don't get any data, any useful data from, from an update. Like you don't get the, the updated data, you just get the count, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so moving on, uh, yeah, we'll now write our simple test queue so we can see some, some action happening. So we are going to create a test queue, and because all of our methods are going to use the transactor, we are going to group these methods in a class, uh, which is going to be parameterized with a transactor. Um, so first we are going to write a method which processes one, 
one message is going to return uh, an IO, not a connection IO, but an IO, so a description of some side effects. Uh, and it's going to return a Boolean uh, specifying if a message was processed or not. So what we will do in this method is we will receive a single message and this will run a transaction which uh, actually uh, which will receive the message. And then we flat map on the result, right? So we see if a message is received or not. And if there was no message, we just return false over here. And if we have found the job, what we are going to do is we are going to run some business logic for the job. And then what we need to do is we need to delete the job from the queue. And I have to write the delete method in a second. And we are going to run that in a transaction. So you can see there's quite a lot of code to still write. Transactor. And finally, we're going to map that to true because we have processed the message. Uh, so now let's, let's quickly write a method to delete a MS, uh, to delete a message from our queue. It will take a UUID over here, and it's a connection IO of a unit. So nothing new here, just all the boring uh, Ruby code, which is uh, delete from uh, from jobs where ID is equal to the given one, and it's an update, and we discard the results. Okay, so we've got that. We still need to write the business logic. So let's write the business logic for processing a job, and it will be a side effect, uh, an arbitrary side effect. So what we are going to do is we are going to sequence three things. So first, we are going to uh, do a print line, uh, starting job, and we're going to print the job that we are starting and then that we are ending. And bef between starting and ending, uh, between starting and ending, what we are going to do is we are going to sleep for three seconds. So a couple of notes on that uh, business logic code. So what we do here is we, uh, the business logic for a given, again, returns a description of side effects that, that should be done. This description will only actually happen once it's interpreted by calling unsafe unsync or some other method. So what we are doing here is we are composing three side effects uh, using a, a for comprehension. Uh, this actually, so if you don't know much Scala, this is actually the same as calling flat map uh, twice. So we are sequencing three things. We are creating the first side effects, uh, then we are sequencing it with a sleep, and then we are sequencing it with the uh, the ending job print line, right? Um, also, an important note is that the IO sleep isn't going to actually block any threads. So when the interpreter sees uh, that it should sleep for three seconds, what it will do, it will put the the, the IO that is currently executed on the side for three seconds, and it will bring back uh, after three seconds uh, the 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 next effect and the sequence will be run. Um, so that's our non-blocking uh, business logic, uh, which which we will use here. Okay, so uh, now our process one method is complete. So once we have that, we can actually write a, a method which will process message continuously. Continuously, oh, that's a hard word, IO of unit. So when we want to process message continuously, we process a single message and then we sequence it with an effect. Uh, so uh, if there was nothing in the queue, we probably want to wait for some time uh, until some uh, some date on the queue arrives. So we will have an optional delay. So if, uh, if, an, uh, if a message was processed, we don't actually do anything. So we just return an empty description of side effects. And otherwise we sleep for one second. Uh, so that's uh, that's where we wait for for, me for messages if if none have been processed. Um, so now we have a description of a process. The, de the delay is a description of a process which optionally waits for uh, for one second. So we sequence that with a, a recursive call to continuous processing. Right. So to process these messages continuously, we process one message. We optionally wait for more messages, and then we again process continuously, which we'll call process one and so on and so on. And uh, this will happen forever. It also, it sucks because uh, that's not like directory recursion. 
you might know that uh, you might note that at all times we are working with descriptions of side effects, right? So when the interpreter is going to evaluate that, it's going to see a description of a side effect. And so uh, the way it works roughly is that uh, this uh, this call will be done like one level of recursion will actually happen. Then the interpreter will see that it's got a new uh, description to evaluate. So it will unwind the stack and then run this new description. It will un unwind the stack and so on and so on. So this is all nice and thread safe. Okay. So we are almost ready. We can process this message continuously, but to actually see some action, we also need to be able to insert messages continuously. So we will write a method insert continuously counter int and IO unit. Uh, and to insert things continuously into our job queue, we will call insert a job counter. We will insert a new uh, value into our database. We will run that into a, in a transaction. We will sequence that with sleeping for 500 milliseconds. And then we will continue with inserting continuously, but with counter increased by one. Okay. So now we can both insert and process. Um, so now we can combine two processes into one, right? We have, uh, you can notice that we are building a more and more complex descriptions of business logic uh, from, from like simpler pieces, right? So we started with methods which uh, describe operations on the database. Then we have described effects like arbitrary side effects, which process a single message. Using that, we described a program or an effect which continuously process messages and so on. So now we are going to create a, a describe a program uh, which uh, inserts and processes at the same time. So again, it's going to be an IO of unit. So what we are going to do here is first, uh, we are going to insert continuously, starting from zero, obviously. Um, then we are going to process continuously. Okay, and yes, yield. Okay, does this compile? It does. Cool. So uh, we can now actually run our code. So let's comment that. So what we need to do here is we need to create a new test queue using our transactor. And we are going to take the insert and process description um, and that's uh, and that still needs to be run. So we need to call unsafe unsync. Uh, we are still running this only once at the end of our code when the whole description of our complex process is done. So this won't quite work yet because what we are doing here is where we are sequencing two effects. We are sequencing a, an effect which continuously inserts things and this will actually never end. So we will never actually get to the processing part, right? That's an effect which will loop indefinitely. It will insert things, uh, well, it will insert sleep, insert sleep, right? So we need a way of running this in the background. And we can do that. So we can do that by uh, adding a start here. So that start method will create a description of a process which will start a process in the background and it gives back a fiber. So the return type over here well, let's go over here. Oh, it's, it's, it's a fiber. So a fiber is like a lightweight thread um, that's managed by uh, by the cuts effect here uh, runtime. Um, it's uh, much lighter than a Java thread, so you can create lots of these uh, thousands uh, safely. Um, and the, these all all, uh, all of these fibers are going to be uh, scheduled to run on a small pool of threads. Uh, by the scheduler. Um, so when an I.O. effect is being interpreted, it's going to be interpreted step by step in, in chunks. So a couple of steps from one effect, then the scheduler will evaluate, it, uh, evaluate a couple of steps from another effect from, from another fiber and so on. So um, here we are starting this description in the background. And uh, so this will, uh, this will complete in a single step, and then we can call the process continuously in the main thread. Um, we should probably also join on that uh, on that fiber, which is like 
probably good practice, but though it will never happen uh, unless something weird happens in our code. Okay, so let's try running this and see if we actually get any messages that are being processed. Okay. So we should see, we should see some, you know, logs that uh, yeah, jobs are getting started uh, being processed and ended being processed, right? So we can see job job zero, job two, and uh, we should also probably see some. Yeah, you can see that there's a lot of jobs in the backlog, and uh, well, that's because our processing code isn't really uh, performant enough, right? We insert a new job every half a second but we only process them uh, so each processing takes three seconds right so uh, we will get more and more messages so to solve it we actually need to have more concurrent process processes right we need to uh, to process messages concurrently from many fibers uh, and that's quite easy like how 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 can you do that so let's say we want to run four of those in parallel so what we will do is we will replicate the description of our processes uh, we will create a list of four descriptions so we will take a one to four that's a sequence of four numbers and convert it to a list and we map each number to a description of a process so a uh, result of this expression will be a list of four ios right it will be a let me just write it list of io of unit uh, that's the type of this expression, right? It's a it's a list of four descriptions of processes. Um, so we actually need to run those in the background so that uh, you know things happen concurrently. Um, so now we will get a list of a fiber of unit. Um, but that's not uh, that's not the end. We still need to convert our list of processes, a process which runs all of these in sequence. Right, because we want to run the first uh, fiber, then we want to run the second fiber, the third, and so on. So we need to run all of these in, in sequence. And there's a helper method which allows you to convert a list of process descriptions into a process which runs everything in sequence. And that method is called sequence, unsurprisingly, maybe. And now we will actually see four concurrent processes happening at the same time. So we can run this. Uh, it um, still won't be enough, right, to process all messages. But though, though you can see that there are four at a time right now, and we can easily increase it to 20, let's say. So now, now we should have more than enough computing power to actually process all the messages that are being inserted into our uh, into our queue. And yeah, you can see that there's like a lot of traffic right now, and probably here the queue is getting smaller. Uh, and smaller, yeah, slowly but getting smaller. Um, right now it reaches a stable state because uh, all of the jobs have been processed, and uh, while the old ones are being executed, new ones are being inserted. So there's always going to be some backlog, but it's going to be stable and small. Um, okay, so we've seen uh, we've seen some Doobie, we've seen some uh, way of composing concurrent processes. Uh, as a bonus. Uh, so before before we end, I have uh, a couple of summary things I would like to say uh, uh, as well. Uh, well, the first thing is like, where is the functional programming in here, right? Uh, so I think a, a good summary of functional programming is that functional program is really function is really programming with functions, as the name suggests. Uh, but what these functions do is uh, these functions manipulate immutable values, right? And this can be very simple. So it can be as simple as adding two numbers. It can be as simple as transforming a case class into another case class, so manipulating data. Uh, but it also can be manipulating data, which represents, for example, descriptions of side effects or descriptions of operations on a data. And that's exactly what's happening here, right? We have our values. They are immutable. Each, uh, sorry, each, uh, each connection I.O. value uh, that we have created here, that's an immutable value which we can further you know, manipulate and, special and, and specialize. Uh, because things are immutable, we have no problems with threading whatsoever. Um, 
So yeah, we have our immutable values and values are transformed by various functions. So the functions are, for example, flat map, which is sequencing two things, right? It takes a uh, flat map is a function which takes two effects and combines them into one. It takes two immutable values and returns an immutable value which represents a sequential evaluation of these two, right? We have a function which is transact. Uh, so this function takes an immutable description of uh, operations on a database and returns a description of an effect which uh, will start a transaction, run the, uh, run the, the, on the, on the database and commit. We have unsafe transing, which again is like an, in, it, you can think about it as an interpreter or as a compiler. So it takes a description of side effects and it transforms them into actual things happening, right? So we have, that, that's, that's where the functions are. So that's where the functional programming here really is. Um, and, you know, that the, the, the approach that we've seen here, so um, of separating the description uh, of what we want to do and actually doing things, this not only gives us, the, well, pre, 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 predominantly this gives us a lot of flexibility in how we can structure our programs and how we can compose them, but it's also, you know, quite common in, in, in other libraries. So first of all, in, in all of uh, effect, uh, in all of in all of libraries which represent effects, uh, so Zio, Monix, Cuts effect, uh, they all use the same approach. Uh, the projects I'm working on, which is HTTP client and and Tapir uh, for working, for working with HTTP, they take a similar approach as well. So we first the request or we first describe the endpoint and then we interpret it. Um, and that's also quite close to free monads if you've heard about uh, the term. That's all. Like the, the the idea is roughly the same. That first you describe the structure, and then you or then you interpret it. Um, and that's uh, all I had. And so uh, thank you very much for for listening. As I said, like the uh, the code can be found uh, here on GitHub. I will post the link on Meetup later. Uh, there's some uh, additional material on how you can structure transactions with drawings and some helper code on our blog. Um, if you are starting with Scala, we also created like a web page with materials where you can find information on uh, tutorials, uh, local setup, uh, podcasts, uh, articles, and so on. So uh, if, if you are starting with Scala, that might be useful. Um, and yeah, if you have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Adam. That was excellent. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, let's see. So I think um, the main one is relating to uh, Dibby and uh, also performance with Hibernate. Um, do you know if there's a, a performance difference between Dibby and Hibernate? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know of any benchmarks that would uh, that would show any difference. Uh, I would suspect if there was any difference, that would be in favor of Dubi, uh, because Dubi is like much closer to the database, right? We just uh, in, have prepared statements. There is probably some overhead from, uh, but that's like probably natural. Uh, usually, the, the the overhead for creating you know immutable case classes and immutable data structures comparing to uh, the overhead of actually you know going to the network and talking to a database that's uh, that prob that usually dis disappears um hibernate uh, then has the overhead of pro of ref reflection and to reflectively read the data and write data so uh if any i would suspect that there might be a s small preference to do be uh, but I don't know if both of these effects wouldn't disappear because of the network communication taking place. But I, I, I don't know of any benchmarks. Yeah, I, I agree with you that I think the biggest difference would be the fact that you do have uh, the control over the queries in DB because you are writing in SQL. Oh yeah, of course. Like uh, debugging uh, Hibernate or JPA generated SQLs is. Uh, is a job I don't wish anybody would have to do. Like uh, usually, 
don't want to look at those, right? And uh, they usually are much, uh, well, usually. It happens that they are much more complex than they need to be, right? If you have, if you have any complex joints, uh, anything more like than a simple join in between two tables, so any kind of situations like this, uh, for sure you are going to write a better query by hand than, than letting uh, it be automatically generated. Uh, so, so yeah, I, that's also a big plus for actually writing the SQL is that um, anything that is more complex than a simple select or a simple join, uh, well, you have full control o over that, how, how that gets executed. Well, I'll Thank you very translate, much. Yeah. I'll be sure to share the uh, Scala page later on as well. Um, it looks really useful. It's great that you put that together. Thanks. Um, and I think that uh, we have no more questions. Thank you so much uh, for doing some live coding for us. It was absolutely fantastic <laughs> to watch, and I really love uh, seeing some DB. So thank you very thanks. much. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming, and you know where to find me online. So uh, if you would have any questions, you know, uh, feel free to ask. So uh, it's. Um, Probably time for us to wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it was uh, absolutely great to see you all. And uh, please come next month as well. Uh, we'll have uh, Chris Virtual, who'll be speaking uh, on generic derivation in Scala 3. And uh, if any of you want to uh, apply to speak, um, we'd be very happy to have you. OK. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And yeah, again, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. And also thanks to Roxolana. Thanks uh, so much. I know that you guys are on uh, odd time zones true, true. compared to us. So thank you for <laughs> staying so late. <laughs> it's not that late. Yeah. Okay. See you around then. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Roxolana. Thanks. Um, I'd usually stay behind for a chat, but uh, unfortunately, I have to go and look after my new little cat. Uh, so uh, I'll see you all next month. And uh, if you guys want to catch up with me, uh, you can uh, always reach out to me on Twitter. It was great to see you all. Thank you.